Jones. Okay, next movie. And our next movie is a superhero saga named Blade, based on the popular comic book about a character who is half vampire and half something else. He's not sure just what. Maybe not human. And he's dedicated his life to fighting vampires who are secretly buying up and taking over the great American cities. He's played by Wesley Snipes, and his vampire arch enemy named Frost is played by Stephen Dorff. It's a shame, you know. When I think of what you've become, and what you should have become, I guess I don't blame you. I mean, with everything that's happened, it's the human side of you that's made you weak. Blade rescues a blood specialist played by neighbor Shea Wright from an attack by a vampire in a morgue and helps her to freedom. <laughs> Then he brings her back to headquarters where a mysterious old vampire fighter played by Chris Christopherson once again has raised him and trained him for the war against vampires. She's been bitten. Should have killed her then. Yeah, I know. But I didn't. The vampires have a secret temple where they plan their conquest, and in the film's climactic scenes, it's played for humanity against the horrors of the undead. Blade joins a recent group of comic book superheroes who have been brought to the big screen. Batman and Superman, of course, come to mind, and also the Crow, the Phantom, the Mask, Spawn, the Men in Black. Who have I left out? I'm waiting for Archie and Jughead. Oh. Gone are the days where heroes dressed in costume were considered a camp and not a box office draw. The superhero movie is now one of the primary sources of blockbuster cinema entertainment and of box office bucks. During the time, the possibility that Norse gods, shrinking high-tech suits, and purple aliens covered in galactic jewelry would dominate our theaters would have seemed ludicrous. Who's laughing now? Huh? <laughs> So, how did this surge of mainstream popularity begin? Superheroes have sporadically been the stuff of blockbusters in the past. 1978's Superman the Movie and 1989's Batman were two standout examples. But none of these films led to the lasting popularity for capes and masks as moviegoers are experiencing today. Many trace this current trend back to two movies, X-Men and Spider-Man. As a modest success in 2000, X-Men proved superpowered characters and costumes could be accepted by audiences. Just two years later, Spider-Man achieved mega blockbuster status. Victor, take one A mark. B mark. There's another film that serves as the granddaddy of the modern superhero film, and truly paved the way for the genre, Blade. By 1997, the comic book film was dead on arrival. Hollywood studios began to make stock, derivative, soulless cartoons on film which turned off most moviegoers. Joe Schumacher's bloated mess, Batman and Robin, was released in June 1997 and kicked off a wave of terrible comic book films that would ripple throughout the summer. On August 1st, 1997, the film adaptation of Todd McFarlane's comic book property Spawn premiered with Michael J. White playing the lead role. The film is best remembered for having terrible special effects and being hindered by a PG-13 rating. To add insult to injury, two weeks later, Shaquille O'Neal's film adaptation of DC still dropped. This was the final straw. You could hear the death knell. At this point, film studios had no idea how to ensure the comic book adaptations they greenlit actually resonated with both fanboys and casual filmgoers. Based on a Marvel Comics character with roots in Hammer Horror movies and 70s black exploitation cinema, Blade was released on August 21st, 1998 and caught everyone completely by surprise. Director Steven Norrington and writer David S. Goyer took the elements of the comic and crafted a taut, thrilling tale centered on a half-human, half-vampire stalker of the undead. Well, I remember reading Tomb of Dracula, which is the Marvel comic that Blade uh, first appeared in. I think he showed up in 72 or 73. I would have been 
seven years old, and I remember going down uh, to the uh, local drugstore and uh, grabbing one of the Tomb of Dracula comics off the spinner, and I just thought Blade was the coolest character I'd ever seen. And I love the fact that he was so much darker and more brutal than Captain America. He just seemed completely different to inhabit a different kind of world. And I'd always had a fondness for the character, and because of that, I, I just thought it would translate well to film. He doesn't have a bunch of costumes, and he's got gadgets, but but they're all... I mean, it sounds odd to say, but Blade was a much more realistic character in, its, in his own way. He was transformed genetically after his mother was bitten by a vampire, who I'm still looking for to this day. Can't wait to meet up with Daddy again. And uh, it made him half human half vampires so he's very he's always in a struggle internal struggle between the good and bad forces as a child by Whistler, who becomes his guide and sage, and his uh, mentor and friend, and uh, teaches him that there's another way to deal with his condition, and another way to channel his anger. With Wesley Snipes bringing a reserved but still compelling performance to the character, Film fans were treated to a horror-action hybrid that would lay the groundwork for the soon-to-explode popularity of superhero film. The production design process begins with my meetings with Stephen uh, Norrington to decide what he wants in the film. Ultimately, he's the designing chief of this whole thing. It's his image, it's his vision, and my job is to give him and bring that and then add to that if I can. To begin that process, we work with conceptual illustrators and I was blessed to have a great team of these of guys, each having their own style and each we would focus and guide to use his style to our advantage or to his advantage. Uh, one of the guys, Tani Kinatani, has a wonderful style and very clean, very slick and uh, he was very good with lighting and mood, and he was wonderful in helping me to design and figure what would the world of Frost be, or the vampire be. We would begin with uh, location photos of existing locations, research photos that I would gather, and I'd bring them to the table, and we'd talk about it, and I'd, we'd have to find a camera angle that would really work. The most important piece to this is that these things can be done. Other guys were very good at weapons. Mark Messenger was instrumental in creating not only the storyboards for the film but a, a lot of the weaponry. It's a wonderful style of mechanics and cleanliness to really be able to cleanly have something built. His, his designs are, are quite wonderful. In another way, Patrick Janicki's work was instrumental in bringing life to the motorcycle and a lot of the, uh, the other sets and weapons that we had. His work is very bold, very flamboyant, he's very much involved in the motorcycle culture, so he knew his mechanics terrifically. He would give us different views that we could actually take these images, take them to a, an, a company that would create this machine and they could work off of, and sculpt off of these images as well as architectural plans for each one of the, the bikes. We designed Blade's vehicle. Initially it was hard, really coarse, rough. We changed inevitably, knowing Wesley's character, to a really very slick, Blade wouldn't let the car be damaged really. It was a little bit too much to have a blower and those kind of elements, so we wanted to become very realistic. And ultimately, Steve Norrington himself was a genius in and uh, using Photoshop and his illustration ability to uh, let me know what concepts that he would like to do. He, we brought him Balinese tattoos, 
and he took a photo of Wesley and literally sat down and over the course of a half an hour created this image, which was so dramatic and so in radical that it, that it became part of Wesley's character and uh, it really was wonderful. We developed weaponry together. We had issues with once you once you design a weapon or when you do uh, architectural design, sometimes the, the illustration is wonderful looking, but when it is built, there are, there are problems. So what we did ended up doing was taking real machines, real mechanics, Photoshop, putting them in Photoshop, and adjusting to very specific uh, machining requirements. This was given to a, a prop manufacturer and was built exactly as this image was drawn. So that is the hero weapon prior to its manufacturing. Finally, all this work that we do before the filmmakers step foot on stage really gets, it, or is meant to excite the studio, is to get an impression, a mood, and have everyone on the same wavelength when we come together. There's 120 some odd people, plus now with visual effects teams, that are on the same page. We all have to kind of make the same movie and I'm fortunate enough to be the ringleader. I get to begin that process with a director creatively coming to a, a wonderful visual storytelling medium. So it was about two years ago we began Blade and uh, I had known Steve Norrington, the director, from 15 years ago. Uh, we worked together on Greystoke, which Rick Baker was in the head of. and. So I've known Steve for many years, and I've seen him off and on. I've gone over to England and saw him working on uh, some of the Henson films, and he was creating all these incredible makeup effects and everything. And also, uh, Bob Engelman, who's the producer, I did The Mask with. He produced The Mask with Jim Carrey. So I knew both of them really well from when this project started. I had talked to them about uh, just doing the pearl makeup, which was the huge uh, vampire in the film because of the budget restraints and everything. And I said, you know, it'd be really fun to do the whole project if I could. And I hadn't done a fun vampire film in a long time because uh, I did The Lost Boys way back, you know, 10 years ago. And I really enjoy working on those kind of films when I can. This was based on a comic book, so you can take a lot of license with this kind of vampire film. Uh, Coppola's makeup in his film, I tried to do very uh, gothic and subtle, and you know, it was a whole style I tried to do. It's like The Lost Boys. I tried to do a whole style with that. I based the whole makeup on the contact lenses I designed, and Joel Schumacher was very adamant that he wanted uh, to keep them very uh, beautiful looking, these young people, and the teeth should look like pearls. So I did a very subtle, really beautiful teeth for that. For this film, I really, you know, it, it had to be violent in places. It had to really, you know, it had to have a different style, but you could have a lot of fun with it. So you could do big teeth here and there because it didn't have to make perfect sense in every scene on what happened with it. So you have a lot of license with this kind of film because you can, you have a lot of, there's a lot of humor in the film. You can have fun with it. And some parts should be overdone a bit you know, to make it work for that scene. Is that, is that you? He's here! He's here! This must be Pearl, uh. the record keeper. The Pearl character, uh, Steve wanted this huge, massive uh, vampire, and he would just sit there, and he couldn't move. He'd been there for hundreds of years, and they would bring him young kids to feed on and uh, blood packs to drink out of, and he ran the computer thing and guarded the door to the vault of the info of the slay of the vampires and everything. And uh, <clears throat> that was the big makeup, even though it was a very short part in the film, but it was a lot of fun because it was, you know, we'd never done anything this big before. So we figured out about a pound, how many pounds he should weigh, like about uh, 1,500 pounds or something. And then Miles Tevis did a drawing of this huge thing, which was very round. And then we gave that to Steve, and then he put it on the computer and stretched the whole thing out. So it was this massive uh, 
much heavier than we imagined, and we all looked at that and went, yeah, that, that's the way it should be, and Steve liked it a lot, so that's what we used to go off of was a stretched version. The character for Pearl was played by Eric Edwards, and this poor guy, we had to get him and put him in a chair and cast him in the position sitting on this chair because when we built the final thing, it was going to be this massive puppet. We had uh, five actors inside of it. We had the actor with his head out the top. We had an actor for an arm over this side, an actor way over here for the arm on that side. And we had uh, puppeteers working the feet inside. We made it out of silicone. We wanted it to be very translucent. So we poured a huge amount. I think it was like $7,000 worth of silicone into this massive mold to make this skin that uh, was very fleshy. And then we had to do the makeup that blended down onto the neck of him with Eric in the side of this. So what we'd have to do is we'd do uh, makeup on Eric with the makeup, which took uh, myself and Steve about three hours to do. And then we'd fit him in there and we'd have to whole, finish the whole makeup. So once he was in it, he had to stay there. And it got very hot and we had air conditioners running inside this body and all this activity and TV screens inside the body. and it was pretty funny and then we had a giant bladder they were standing on in the back making the chest go up and down and uh, we we're trying to get some movement to it the trouble with something like this is we didn't have enough time to really work out so we could get more movement out of it which we really wanted to try to do but in the video Steve did some uh, computer generated bits of the body moving and that which looked pretty neat so that was a huge amount of work and just they had to basically uh, build a moving trailer which this was built on and molded on so that uh, it was all sculpted on it was the trailer was moved somewhere else the mold was made on it was brought back and we made it and then it was on the trailer it was shipped down to the studio where a hydraulic lift then had to take it and set it onto the stage the whole body unit and work it into the set and it was a massive uh, undertaking for this creature. What we wanted to do in the action in Blade was to incorporate uh, a number of martial arts that uh, had uh, a, hard, a hard style to it, uh, a soft style to it. Um, Blade's character, we wanted to have him more on a fluid side, and uh, which would encompass both hard and soft. And for for Frost, who is, plays the bad guy. Uh, we wanted uh, him to be more straightforward and direct and that fall to a, a Japanese or hard style. The, uh, the inspiration for this was from uh, a film that I uh, like a lot and it was um, Sword of Doom. In that film you see the, the ultimate cut slash uh, fighting with uh, the katana. We uh, checked out a few other action films that had some good sword play and from that we did everything we could to stay away from the seemingly popular Hong Kong action films and uh, try to bring out our own um, rawness basically. <coughs> Sword goes down. And she's like, stab! Watch 
marché de poids ici. There's a reason that you do special effects work in the first place. It was determined that it was far too dangerous and too expensive to shoot a sword fight in a real subway tunnel, a real subway train tunnel, while there was a 60 or 80 mile an hour train passing through that was just a few inches from the, you know, Wesley Snipes and our and the rest of the actors. Ultimately, the decision was made to build a section of subway train tunnel on the stage out in Canoga Park to film the fight sequences over green screen and then to introduce a computer generated fully synthetic subway train into the tunnel while the fight scene was going on. The production bought three subway trains. They actually had them on the lot up on blocks and they were using them for interior scenes that were taking place inside that subway train after my sequence was finished. And there was a couple of exterior shots I think that they used them for. But it was fortunate to have them around because I had a perfect model available to me for a, a computer simulation. So I hired Viewpoint Data Labs to fly in from Utah and do a surveying on the uh, subway train and some weeks later they provided me with a very accurate computer model of one of the subway trains in its entirety. The roof, the, the walls, the interior, the wheels, everything. And so what happens is that by hand, this, uh, on a frame by frame basis, this train is moved around horizontally, vertically, and they're slid along a track, you can rotate them. Change the camera. Also, the camera, that's the, uh, that's the, the object that controls the position of the train, but you can also move the camera around. If we're to lower the camera, then the train goes up. If we move the camera to the right, the train goes to the left. If we move the camera back, train goes away so this this object here behaves just like a real camera in fact we can even insert a lens value here that will simulate the lens of the camera in terms of millimeters or inches you can do uh, camera rolls so the idea is to use these controls to be able to position the train relative to the background on a frame by frame basis and there are schemes that have been devised to use sort of automatic methods of camera tracking the background we tried some of those but ultimately decided that it would work better and probably work faster if we just eyeball the whole thing and you can see that the camera bounce has all been programmed into this. The train is bouncing around the same way that the tunnel is. So now we're going to whip pan around and follow the train. There we go. And that scene, you can actually, the camera's actually looking inside the windows of the train and you can see the little cutouts that I have of the people in. See there, right there. Those are the folks. <clears throat> Now, without the pictures in the background, the thing plays back a little faster. You can see all the people that are in there. And there's a texture map of all the little stills that I took. That's me, actually, right there. I think that one is me. The train is moving really fast. The motion blur takes the curse, on, takes the curse off of a lot of the detail that's in there. And so I decided that 
just sticking sort of cardboard cutouts almost of, of these people at a particular view, either the side view or front view or sitting down, and just taking that, that cutout that was there, that image, and just uh, putting a control in it so that as it passed by, it would always face the camera. Because if I didn't do that, at some point it would go edge on and it would just disappear. So I had a rotation going in on, on each one of the characters as it was going by. And it's, it serves to give the illusion that, that there's some population in there. If you really went single frame through there and examined the train very closely, you would see stuff that, uh, that doesn't look right in there. But to, to get the, uh, the illusion of, of people populating the interior of it worked just fine. This train we were thinking originally would travel at about 60 or 70 miles an hour and it just looked too fast. When you start speeding things up they also start to lose mass. They look like toys at some point. So we slowed the train down and it began to look heavier and more menacing. And so we ended up at a speed of about 40 miles an hour. And we're going to break right through it. So we're actually inside the train here car number one and like I said we didn't use this part of it but it was kind of fun to play around with it on this level this film was in production for nearly two years and there was a ton of effects work and some of it was sort of in flux as the film was progressing and in addition to the 28 shots involved in the in the subway train sequence there was a variety of more modest projects that came up and some of those were offered to me including a couple of slow motion bullet shots that are fired out of Blade's gun. But at one point in the new ending that they designed for it, there was some more blood that was required and so they came to me and we came up with a design for it and about three weeks before the negative was due I took on the job and really got into it and turned out two really high density scenes of very difficult liquid animation hey blade let's do it One is where Blade swings around and slices Frost through the abdomen, launching the upper part of his body up into the air. Blood grows, blood sort of tendons grow between the two halves of the body. They join and then they pull the, the top half of the body, the torso, back down to the pelvis and reconstitute it. And there's a splash of blood at the end. <laughs> Another one where his hand reconstitutes out of liquid blood and then the skin reveals up over it and his hand reconstitutes also. And they're they're fairly they're very fairly difficult shots to do, uh, even under the best circumstances, and there was not much time in the schedule to do it, and it was an all-out effort. But they turned out great. Too late, Lee. I want to be startled. I want to be dazzled when I go to the, the movies. And I think that there's huge realms of work that has not been touched. The animation of liquids and unseen mystic forces and dreams. And uh, I don't think that we're, we're anywhere close to realizing that, that kind of work yet. Blade first came to us, I think, I think as a pitch from a director named Ernest Dickerson, who wanted to adapt it. And then I met with the guys from Marvel at the time, it was this fellow Joseph Calamari, and he had mentioned that LL Cool J wanted to play the character, and we started talking about it on that level, and I think David Goyer was, came in on the pitch with Ernest Dickerson, and we started doing a deal for it, and then David went off to write the script, and eventually it grew into this bigger movie. 
because the mostly because of the script David wrote. He wrote a really good first draft, and he kind of got the you know attempt to, to kind of follow in the footsteps of the first Batman movie. So the first draft convinced us that it should be a larger film, and it kind of sat around with us for a while, and we were exploring different actors. And then Wesley Snipes was frustrated with the, the progress on Black Panther, which is another comic book adaptation and development at, at Columbia. And he freed up and, and read our script and liked it a lot, and then it kind of went from there. And then Ernest was off doing something else, so we were looking for another director. And it led us to this guy, Steve Norrington, who made this low-budget movie that was very well shot and well directed in terms of action and we all thought he was the right guy for the job and kind of got was they wanted to do kind of a take on the on Hong Kong action films and Hong Kong martial arts and it incorporated well into Blaze Universe. I think that Norrington maybe his world view is perhaps a little bit of a comic book view, but it's bigger than life. It's more extreme. The colors are denser, the the blacks are darker, the, the shadows are deeper. Uh, it's he sees, you know, almost like in scope. Uh, and even though the ap the aspect ratio of a comic book is certainly not the scope, it's one three three. I mean, they're they're, they're squares. Uh, no one can see very graphically, very visually, and he tells a story visually. You know, I mean, there's a lot of Goyer's explanation in the movie, but what really moves the story along is the visual storytelling. We had ideas about a, a program where Frost would keep people in cold storage for his bloodletting, so a human blood bank in other words. So we took literally blood banks, uh, elongated them, put people inside of them, and uh, gave a concept of initially what would be one body bag as a, as a starter program, inevitably being a factory of, bloody, of, of blood holding body bags, keeping these people in a state of, uh, of, of cool and um, would be able to pull the, you know, actually store and uh, feed off of these people while keeping them alive. It's part of the story point that actually was removed from the picture. How'd you get that scar, Deacon? A born vampire would have the power to regenerate from birth. You must have gotten scarred before you return. Isn't that right? Vampires like you aren't a species. You're just infected. A virus, a sexually transmitted disease. I'll tell you what we are, sister. We're the top of the fucking food chain. And the blood tide's coming, and after tonight, you people are fucking history. It's a hurricane. An act of God. Anyone caught in its path will instantly be turned. Everyone you've ever known. Everyone you've ever fucking loved. It won't matter who's pure blood and who's not. How are you gonna cure the whole fucking world? Hmm. And Blade's blood is the key. <laughs> We've been trying to kill this guy for years. He turns out to be our salvation. That's the beauty of destiny. If you turn everybody into vampires, whose blood are you going to drink? Come with me. Neat, huh? I can keep him alive for years, producing anywhere from 10 to 15 pints of blood a day. Of course, this is just a pilot program. Once the tide comes, we're going to have to step up production. You're disgusting. Why? Because we live at another species' expense? It's called evolution. Survival of the fittest. We've got an intruder. Beautiful. Endings are really important. Um, if you have a great movie and your last ten minutes aren't so great, I mean, they're, they're really important because it's, it's the last impression that people are, you know, that you leave with people. You can have a spectacular movie and uh, fail the audience in the last 10 minutes and completely lose them. On the other hand, you can have a movie that doesn't start out so great, and as long as it ends on a strong note, people will forgive quite a bit. Endings are very important. I, and I don't know why, but, but typically they are the most difficult thing to write. They're the most difficult thing to film. 
Um, in quite a few of the films I've been involved in, there have been multiple endings. Uh, part of the reason is you never know what you're going to get when you make a movie. You never know uh, which performances are going to pop. Things that, that work really well on the written page just end up working horribly, you know, on screen and, and, and vice versa. You, you have no idea. And so you, you, you can think a scene will play, you know, excellently and when it's cut together it's just flat and dead as a dog and conversely you could be really worried about a sequence uh, in script form and then it ends up being brilliant and it turns out not to be a problem at all and and it's it's always there's always a sense of discovery when you watch a film for the first time and, and you never know what you're you're going to get I mean writing a script is not the same thing as making a movie it, uh, the script is the blueprint and it's in it goes through an evolutionary process in the original script, we had this ending with Lamagra. Dorf, Stephen Dorff's character, Deacon Frost, would turn into this big... I think originally, actually, he, he, he calls forth this big blood monster that would be like a Lovecraftian monster. And then we kind of, before we shot the movie, decided that he himself should turn into Lamagra. But we all kind of thought, it's a little cheesy, this big blood thing, conceptually. And we saw, we saw actually, like, still animatic shots of it. We never really thought it was that great, but we thought maybe it'll work. So we kind of went into it a little doubtful. And then eventually it just looked like this big jello thing, you know? And once in the test screenings, once the audience got hooked into Steven Dorff, the minute he was not Steven Dorff anymore and became this faceless, gelatinous, you know, gloopy mass, they just checked out of the movie. You know, they sat there patiently and waited for the end, but they just really were into Dorff as a villain. And the minute he, was off screen and became this thing they couldn't relate to. It got really silly. So we panicked and scrapped the whole thing and decided to, to do a new ending that kept Steven, you know, the, the, the villain because that's what they really liked. So I think it was a conceptual flaw from the beginning. We always thought it was a little sketchy, but it might work, but we never really addressed it and then we paid for it in, in production. You're too late, Blaine. The sleeper has awakened. Ah! You want my blood so much? Take it! Are we having fun yet, Blade? I sure hope so. Because after I'm done with you, I'm gonna fuck the whole human race. I'm not Frost anymore. I'm the plague of darkness. Anyone I touch will be turned. <laughs> Fucking pathetic. What? You see him? Can't help you now, stud. I feel sorry for you. <laughs>
heart's not all night. <clears throat> you know what your problem is? <laughs> so happy to see the sunrise. I need to get back to the lab if I'm gonna cure you. It's over. You keep your cure. I've never felt better. Besides, as long as there's a war going on, I still have a job to do. Oh, yeah? Then you're back on the clock. We never talk about sequels, because it's kind of a jinxy thing to do. And we're never sure. Like, we do just deal with the one movie and trying to make it the best we can. And then, if it works, there's a whole bunch of factors about sequels, including whether the guy wants to return and do another movie, the actor, or whatever, so. There's no question that New Line and Wesley and you know, a lot of the people involved hope that Blade will uh, spawn, you know, no pun intended, another New Line film, uh, other sequels or, you know, TV show or who knows what. It, it really didn't affect what we were doing when we were creating the film. Obviously, uh, the big question to me will be, I mean, Blade is a very graphic, violent, dark movie. And the big question to me will be if, if a second film is made, uh, is will it be more user friendly? Will it go the Batman route? I mean, I, I was very disappointed with the, the Batman films. I thought they got successively worse. Um, you know, uh, if if there's going to be a Blade Happy Meal uh, four or five years from now, I think we're in trouble. Blade became a certified hit at the box office, earning over 130 million on a budget of about one third of that. This was Marvel's first cinematic success and sets the stage for further comic film adaptations. Blade followed the disastrous Howard the Duck as the second Marvel property to get a wide theatrical release in the United States. The Punisher and Captain America both had films made previously, but neither saw a theatrical release in the US. Blade boasted a slick, badass attitude that still holds up today. It revolutionized genre cinema and provided an impressive template from which many superhero films would follow. Oh, and we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that Blade serves up one of the greatest lines in cinema history. Right up there with, I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse, and I don't give a damn line from Gone with the Wind. Skate uphill. <laughs> 